On I-16, these are muscles on I-16 of the perineum. Now, the word perineum literally means around the anus, around the anus. Uh, we're not going to dissect the butt of a cat. <laughs> we're not dissecting its face, we're not dissecting its butt. There are four muscles that I want to uh, mention that I'd still like you to know about. Now, here at the bottom of the pelvis, the outlet, remember there's the opening into the pelvis, the inlet, and then the opening at the bottom where everything comes out is the outlet. And what's holding up? Now, we've got a number of organs in our pelvis, like the urinary bladder. Women have a uterus in the pelvis. So why don't these organs just fall out the bottom? Skin is not strong enough to hold these organs up. So in fact, there's muscles at the bottom of their pelvis, around the outlet. There are muscles, and then the skin is on the outside. So we're going, there are a whole bunch of muscles. We're going to collectively call all of these muscles that cover, that hold up the organs and, uh, around the outlet of the pelvis, we're going to call them the levator ani muscles. And the word levator ani literally means to elevate or hold up the anus stuff. It's also known as the pelvic diaphragm. So uh, we said that they originate on the pubic arches uh, and they insert on the coxy bone. And they uh, support or hold up the pelvic organs. And there are a whole bunch of these muscles. Again, we're not going to learn them by name. Here you can see I circled levator ani. And that includes muscles, including the iliococcygeus and the pubococcygeus. And you'll notice how these muscles are going from the pubic bone towards the tailbone, the coxy bone at the back. And they're just holding up the organs from falling out the bottom of your pelvis. In this picture, is this a male or a female pelvis that we're looking at? Yeah. Yeah. All right, now it, we know that the easiest way to tell whether it's a male or female pelvis is the pubic, uh, the angle of the pubic arch. Uh, we can't see that in this picture, but we still know it's a female because it's, it says there's a vagina here. <laughs> it's always good to look at labels. You know, sometimes people say, I don't know, I'm really confused. I can't tell if it's a male. Oh, it says vagina. <laughs> So here in the uh, outlet uh, area of the pelvis, in women, there are three openings. In guys, there's only two. Both men and women have the rectum, or opening for the anus, and both men and women have the urethral opening, or number one, urinating. Uh, women have an additional opening between the urethral opening and the rectal or anal opening, and that's the vaginal opening or birth canal. So I want to mention a few other muscles. First, the bulbocavernosus muscle. Let's look in the middle set of pictures. In the middle set of pictures, so we see a male on your left and a female on the right. Let's start with the male. Here at the base of the penis is a muscle called the bulbocavernosus. Again, there are really many muscles. We're just giving you some examples. If there's over 650 mus skeletal muscles in the body, we're not presenting all 650. So that's the bulbocavernosus. It's also located here in the female. Let's talk about the male first. This muscle uh, is a skeletal muscle. It's under voluntary control. And if a guy were, let's say, uh, peeing, urinating, he can contract that muscle, which squeezes the base of the penis, and it would stop the urine from flowing midstream. So literally, it tightens that muscle, and it stops the pee from coming out. All right, that contracts that muscle. Uh, that muscle also will contract rhythmically, involuntarily, during an ejaculation. So when a guy ejaculates during a male orgasm, it contracts uh, and relaxes and contracts and relaxes rhythmically. And in that case, it's contributing to spurting of the semen out the penis. So that's the bulbocavernosus muscle in the guy. In the female, the bulbocavernosus muscle is right here. It circles, it encircles both the urethral opening and the vaginal opening, both. All right, so it encircles around both of them. So if a woman similarly were urinating, peeing, 
So if she tightens the bulbal cavernosus muscle, it would squeeze both these structures simultaneously and stop the urine from flowing out midstream. Furthermore, uh, this muscle does contract rhythmically during a female orgasm. When something is inserted into the vaginal canal, I'm trying to be very proper here, when something enters the vaginal canal, a woman can squeeze or tighten around whatever's inside her. And she's using that bulbal cavernosus muscle to squeeze or tighten. Now, interestingly, one of the challenges of childbirth is normally when there's something in the vaginal canal, the reflex is to contract that muscle, squeeze and tighten. If you're trying to give birth, you cannot squeeze or tighten because that pushes the baby back up. So one has to actually open yourself up and relax and prevent yourself from tightening. And so there are actually exercises that uh, women can, are told, suggested to do before giving birth called Kegel exercises, where a woman gets down on all fours, rocks her pelvis back and forth, and practices tightening and relaxing that muscle. So she's more aware of the ability to tighten and relax the bulbal cavernosus muscle. The way that I summarized it is I just wrote it constricts the vaginal opening, or, or uh, the vaginal canal, it contracts during an orgasm, it spurts semen out, it, uh, and so on. That's the bulbal cavernosus. Now, there's also circular muscles, or sphincters, sphincter muscles, around both, uh, that control or regulate number one and number two. So uh, there is a sphincter or circular muscle at the base of the penis, uh, that controls urinating as well. Uh, and there's a circular muscle that you can see right around the anus that's a, an anal sphincter muscle around the anus that controls defecating. Again, in the female, we have similarly this circular round uh, sphincter muscle, uh, uh, external anal sphincter muscle, and uh, there is a sphincter muscle around the urethral opening uh, in the female that could, could specifically control urination. Now, in the bottom picture, so here labeled in the middle, it points to an external urethral sphincter in both the male and female. And so this picture hurts for most guys to look at. They whacked off his penis, because huh. the penis is missing. This is at the base of the penis. And uh, this is the external anal sphincter. So these permit voluntary control over number one and number two, urination and defecation. So why this is very important is that when somebody has the urge to either do number one or number two, you know how you kind of hold it and you're saying, I hope I can make it to time up to the bathroom. <laughs> you're actually keeping this muscle contracted to prevent an accident from occurring. So that's uh, the uh, use of those two muscles. Uh, the area in between uh, uh, the uh, urethral area and the anal area is called the perineum, which we said means around the anus. Listed here, we identified, therefore, the external urethral sphincter, which narrows or constricts the urethral opening for urine, and the external anal sphincter, which narrows, constricts uh, the opening for defecating, or uh, a bowel movement, number two. Okay, so uh, that takes us to page I-17. On I-17, uh, muscles of the uh, hip. And the first muscle that I want to mention is the iliopsoas muscle. And if that sounds familiar, it's because we mentioned it previously. The iliopsoas was that muscle that I called the switch hitter. And uh, we had the iliopsoas pictured on page I-7, I-7 at the bottom. So you might remember the iliopsoas was this muscle right here. And we said that it either pulls the vertebral column down towards the femur, causing bending at the waist, or it pulls the femur, the thigh, up so it's closer to the vertebral column. That's called flexion of the thigh, or the hip. 
So while I mentioned it uh, back on I6 as a muscle, a deep flexor muscle of the abdomen that causes flexion or bending at the waist, I'm mentioning it again on page I17 because it flexes the thigh. A next muscle that I listed is the tensor fascia lata. A lot of people like to pronounce it tensor fascia latte. Yeah. I think they've spent way too much time at Starbucks or something. Uh, it's, a, it's not one of the more important muscles. It's an easy muscle to see. It's a small little muscle right here on the lateral side of the hip. It abducts the thigh. And you'd say, yeah, what does that mean? Abduct means to move away. So it pulls the thigh out, outwards. All right, so as you abduct your thigh, that's what it does. And there are other muscles that adduct the, the thigh. Uh, all right, and then uh, the next muscle, many people's favorite muscle, the gluteus maximus. Uh, this, of course, the gluteus maximus is the prominent muscle on the back of the butt. Gluteal means uh, the buttocks area, and this is the maximus. Now, the gluteus maximus is, uh, originates on the back side of the pelvis, the ilium. It inserts on the back of the femur and it extends and hyperextends the femur. So if you really want to work the gluteus maximus, now I feel like a trainer, all right? So what you're going to do, the stairmaster, running stairs, stairmaster, because you're constantly extending your thigh. Or you can just do this kind of movement, all right? And in fact, and you're welcome to stand up. You know, we got to get real. You're going to be working with patience. So we got to be able to touch ourselves and touch each other. In fact, if there's somebody you want to touch, just say, yeah, I, I need some partner to touch. I've got my anatomy teacher gave me a homework assignment. Right? So, um, so uh, you, if you actually hyperextend your, your thigh, you'll feel it tenses up in the buttocks. You can try it. So uh, that extension and hyperextension is done using the gluteus maximus muscle. And the gluteus medius is a muscle that we indicated uh, on our chart that it abducts the thigh. It brings the thigh out away from the uh, midline. On uh, I-18, I-18, I uh, we also mentioned the gluteus medius muscle. These, uh, these muscles, of course, are listed uh, on our handout, on our one-page handout. The gluteus maximus on our one-page handout, here's how I wrote it out. It originates on the ilium, really the back side of the ilium. It inserts on the femur, it extends and hyperextends the thigh. Notice I wrote that its antagonist is the iliozoas. Why? Because the iliozoas causes flexion of the thigh. And the gluteus maximus causes extension and hyperextension of the thigh. The gluteus medius also goes from the ilium to the femur, and it abducts the thigh. It brings the thigh out away from the uh, midline. That's, again, that's not in bold print. That's not one of our major muscles. But since we've mentioned gluteus maximus and gluteus medius, this picture on I-18 identifies the three most common areas where intramuscular injections are given. The number one uh, place where uh, uh, shots are given is into the deltoid muscle. We've all had a shot, we've all been vaccinated into the deltoid. A second uh, place is in the buttocks. We've all gotten a shot in our butt, probably when we were younger, but we, it happened. Now, where do you give the shot? You don't just give it any place. The reason why is because there's a huge nerve running right here called the sciatic nerve. And it's huge. It's as thick as your thumb. And you don't want to take that needle and possibly hit that sciatic nerve. You might cause permanent paralysis. So you're least likely to hit the sciatic nerve. Basically what we do is whatever cheek, whichever buttock we're using, we basically imagine a cross, and we divide it into these quadrants, and we give the injection into the upper lateral quadrant. The upper lateral quadrant here. 
And you're actually giving the injection into the gluteus medius muscle, which is right above the gluteus maximus. Well, that's actually where it's being given, right here. Uh, if you were giving it in this cheek, you'd be giving it right here. But you're giving the injection up here, not here in the middle, not down there, because then there's a risk of hitting the sciatic nerve. So you give it in the upper lateral quadrant. Uh, the third and final place where an intramuscular injections are commonly given, they can be given all over the place, uh, is actually into a muscle on the side of your thigh called the vastus lateralis, which we'll get to. And uh, diabetics may commonly use the vastus lateralis to give injections. Because that's, if the, you can't give yourself an injection into your own shoulder, you can't give it your own injection into your own butt, but you could give it onto the, either the lateral or medial side of your thigh. On uh, page I-19, there is uh, this uh, really long muscle right here on the front. In us, it's kind of a long, narrow muscle. In the cat, it's a long, wide muscle. In the cat, it looks quite wide. It's called the sartorius muscle. And it's actually the longest muscle in our body. So we're thinking, uh, that wow, that must be really important. Actually, it's not that important. But it's, uh, you can't help not notice it. it. It goes from the anterior superior iliac spine, right on the front of our pelvis. It, it goes kind of diagonally across the thigh. And it actually inserts on the medial side of the tibia. And we, we wrote about this muscle in our one-page handout. The sartorius uh, goes from, it uh, originates on the ilium, and it flexes the thigh. What does that mean? It uh, causes flexion of the thigh or flexion of the hip. Can you think of any other muscle we've learned that also pulls on the femur and brings it up closer to your body? The iliopsoas listed right above. So it also flexes the thigh. So it's a, it's a synergist. The iliozoas is the more important of those two. At the bottom of I-19, and the uh, medial adductor group, there are two muscles that are on the surface, superficial muscles of the thigh. One of them is the uh, sartorius, and the other is the gracilis, this muscle right here. The, uh, the medial adductor muscles, and we're asking you to know three of them, the, the medial adductors originate on the pubic symphysis and they insert on the leg. Remember what all muscles do. They pull the insertion towards the origin. If they insert on the leg, they originate on the pubic symphysis, they bring your legs together. They adduct them. They bring them closer to the pubic symphysis. The gracilis, uh, it happens to insert on the tibia, pulling the legs together. The other two, which both start with the word adductor, that makes it easier to remember. Uh, adductor on page I-20, adductor magnus and adductor longus. So at least their name tells you what they do. The magnus is the big one. And then right above the magnus is a smaller, darker, typically adductor longus. Uh, they are right, actually, right underneath the gracilis. They're right underneath it. They're all pretty simple. They're, they're just going from the pubic symphysis to the leg. These two insert on the femur. The gracilis, the more superficial one, inserts on the tibia. I have not asked you to find the pectineus. On our one-page uh, summary, the three adductors I did put in bold print. Look, they all have the same origin. Uh, two of the three insert on the femur, the first one on the tibia. Uh, they add up the thigh.